Right. Good day. Uh, hi, Spaniso. Welcome to this uh, to this meeting or this uh, conversation. Um, as Spaniso is a, a, a young activist that uh, that I met when he was uh, with the Mpumalanga Youth Against Climate Change, that's based in Emalachleni or Witbank. Um, very active uh, campaigner against coal mining or really for sustainable living, and also currently involved in some, uh, you know, land restoration uh, projects, which we're going to be talking about. But Spaniso, how's it? Thank you for joining us. Uh, can you give us a brief introduction to yourself? I mean, it'd be nice to know where you were born, uh, where you went to school, and how you ended up becoming an activist. That's what we are, are, are heading towards. So yes, nice to see you. Uh, thanks very much, everyone. Um, my name is Bonuso Lamini. I'm from Malasheni. Uh, basically, I was born in Swaziland. That's my that's my mom's side. Then this South African side is my father's side. So I have to be raised on my father's side and in Malasheni. So I started being an activist from school, it, you know. And it was just like very vocal to just even to basic things. But when I moved to Emalasheni, like so we, then the first thing I saw in Emalasheni was like there were a lot of like um mines and there was a lot of mine down everything. So it was it was a long time ago, I think 10 years back, where like I started to realize that. So a thought came on to me that. How can we make an awareness in terms of teaching people about the danger of coal and and how the impact is being done to the environment? So the first idea that come that came to me that I have to use art because I love art so much. So I I knew that if I'm gonna get to the youth, I have to use art. There's no any way for them to see this because I tell most of the young people they believe in mining. They believe they have to finish school and go and work in the mines. There's no any alternative there. So like most of them they are artists they love art so much so even myself i have to use that as a mainstream to do my awareness i like to do my awareness i think when i think 2010 11 i like to use my art there's a year where like we went to cop 17 just to present what we're doing so in those years i formed a group known as Mbumana youth against climate change it was basically a, an art group just to advocate, to teach people about the importance of the environment and to do drama, to do theater. Yeah, we did theater. We came with our first play and we did our second play. Our first play, it was titled, yeah, and the sunrise and the sunset. So it was basically when the sun visited the earth and it finds that earth is crying as mother nature is crying, the plants and the animal. You find everything there is in form of characters. Mother nature is crying and the plants, then you find that there are industries, then there are, then you find that on earth there is global warming. Global warming, she's a queen, you know, like she rules the earth. So the play was based on global warming as a queen that rules the earth. And at the end to create solution. So it had 13 characters. I wrote the script, then I organized like 13 young people to, to do theater and just present it on how climate change is being caused, the causes, the effects, and the solution. So that is our first play of which we did. Can I our second you, play Spanisha, was based you, on... Before, before you continue, can I ask you how you managed to organize that? Was it all voluntary? That, uh, did you get some assistance somewhere? How did you manage to get those young people together to rehearse and perform this play? And where did you perform it? So at first in the management, there's this youth center where like young people are gonna go and play and have some exercise. Some of them do have some free time. So I I had an opportunity to present to, to the idea to many young people of which they were free and say, guys, can we do this and that and that? And two, they volunteered, then a six started to increase, then eight, then 10, then 15, then 20. They started to come into board. So at first I started to do poetry alone with a friend, just to show even the whole play. I did it via poetry alone. Then like somebody interested, wow, that's a good, that's a good. 
So then I told them that, ah, come, let's do poetry. Then they came a little bit, a bit, a bit. Then we finally made a group to say, guys, let's, let's start to plan now to do rehearsal, whole play. Yeah. Then from there on, we started to catch the eyes of the Department of Environmental Affairs in Emalasin. Yeah, we went to the Whitbank News, the local newspaper. They came to visit us for some interviews. They, they wash our place. And it was, it, it was harsh because, like, I remember once we invited to, 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 to play our play and like the, the industries were there and our PHP it in Anglo-American and all those guys that were there and our play like is straight to the point and like we don't have you know like and the municipality officials were there yeah we did our play and there was a moment of silence like they were like shocked like they were like hey, man, these minds and this and they're like in a matter of fact in the team like I had young people of which they were all like they're not scared so like yeah so like yeah that was our first appearance to the community like they were shocked most of them like hey, this guy is just speaking up about something that's different yeah then the government started to want us to uh, to do to help them in terms of our week planting trees where we promote our play but they didn't like our play because we were, we were telling them the truth about them so they they hated our play but they, at the same time they didn't like have to stop the message because the message was straight direct so the government has that sympathy to say the message is like, it is as it, as it is, the Malachian is full of minds and it's gonna sink, it's gonna die. And these young people are saying it as it is. So if we ignore them, like these people are gonna be aware and they're gonna join these young people. So it's there to be many, yeah. Then after a long run, NGOs, they started to, to invite us. They saw us once performing it. Matthew Slaban, South African Revolutional, um, Cancer decided to invite one of their events and groundwork. Then that's where we started to meet activists and said, ah, there are activists who speak about these issues. We've, we've been speaking these issues in the township and we never thought there are NGOs anyway. And we didn't knew even NGOs doing this. So we came, we play our play in Miklopek. Yeah, it was a woman who was watching us playing then. She cried because our courage like global warming was messless. She was like, she was like telling the people that she does not care, like you'll do as you please is. Science to him is nothing, religion, nothing, everything is just nothing to him. So global warming made the people to cry like she, like she was so hard on humans. So yeah, then we did, that's the first time I met activists, the real activists who were protesting about our issues. Yeah, then basically I came to the strike via art. They found me doing art Then they said, yeah, man, come and play, come do us poetry with your team and your group and this and that. We're gonna provide transport and some few tokens. Yeah, then that's how it came about. And tell me, Spiniso, um, um, I, I think because when I met you also, you were a strong campaigner with Mpumalanga Youth Against Climate Change. Um, and I, I just want to, before we talk a little bit more about uh, Pumalanga Youth Against Climate Change. I just want to ask you those impacts that drove you to make these decisions to use your art to try and influence decision makers and, 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 and the community in general and even the, the mining industry. Which impacts um, did you notice? I, I, I did notice. Because I think as as Mbomata against climate change, we were the first young people to speak about those issues. And now when I go back to Emala Lane, there are a lot of young people, lots of young people doing environmental issues, speaking about the same issues we're speaking about. So some of them, if you trace them, like they'll tell you about us. Yeah, bro, our, no, some think, of them do remember us. Yeah, I, th I, think, I, think, I think sorry, um, I, I think um, definitely your work inspired a lot of people in that area. I just want to know, when you speak about those issues that you speak of, which, describe to me those issues. What exactly does the, you spoke earlier and you said that Witbank is sinking. Um, can you describe those kinds of issues, the sinkholes, the dust? How did that affect your local community where you were living? At first and foremost, I think in the group, 80% um, of us, we're staying closer to us. So it was easy for us just to speak the impact. Every time we're gonna see some chimneys burning with live fire on them. And uh, 
there are a lot of people in us, a lot of people with silicosis nearby, all people. And the water, basically, it was a proof that we don't need just to, 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 to we don't need to use the thing. The water was just like, like full of chlorine. So the highly issues were mining, which was affecting us. Mines were closer to the community, and that's still closer even to a lot of those communities. So mines were a threat to our livelihood. So, and the impacts of them was, was physical to, to us, even the health of the people. So the real issues, the number of mines, they were like increasing in numbers. Each and every, after three months or four months, there'll be a new mine. And they were coming closer to the people. And another issue of fish was, was, was a dangerous issue. The trucks, the trucks of fish, they're busy carrying cold and everything. And the dust, much of the dust, but too much of the blasting, because like the blasting, it was cracking houses. I remember we were staying in Forsman. So the people of fish were closer to a local near mine. They had, they are, most of the houses cracked. So that was an issue, like we're talking about even as local people, like this mine is blasting. And like at noon, even at night, they don't even give us a warning. We hear like boom, and the houses are cracking. And the dust, it goes to the roofs and it destroys the roofs. And it destroys those of you who wanna wash their clothes and put everything. So it was the dust and the, the cracks of the houses. So that was physically, it was seen. So I was staying there, I was living near to cracked house and I, I saw the impact. And sometimes like the blasting like will happen like shocking, even like imagine a woman who's pregnant and imagine like, bad situation. So the blasting was just so huge. And then once that mine it blasts, you see the dust coming out like, like, wow, we're in hell now. Recently, like my friend of mine showed me something what was happening while I was staying. A mine is so clear there and it, it did a blast. And the dust, most of it, it went to the street. And like the people were saying, this is crazy. And you know, like there's vanadium and there's, there's vanadium, there's Highfield and there's vanadium near to us. So those industries, there are chimneys each and every evening they are burning and you see smoke up and there's a nearby community of Santa Village and the, the impact is just there, physically there. But mm -hmm. the worry thing is that the people, they want jobs. They want to be employed and now we are doing an awareness, teaching them about the impact of this. Then they want to protest, to, to go to work. At the exactly time they cry about houses are cracking, our houses are cracking, stop this blasting and everything. So it was a little bit hard for us because we find people, the one this and affected, everyone can testify, I'm affected, yo, this mine, this one, everyone, like, you know, when we're doing our plays and now after that, we're gonna do a small talk about the impact of mining. Everyone has a story. Everyone's gonna confess and gonna say, no, this mine's like, no, they did this. Some of them, they retrench people. Some of them, like, they don't pay them the money. Like, they're just doing a lot of things. So everyone got different kinds of stories. So, yeah. Right, someone, and it first man was... Sorry, it, uh, I wanted to say that it's, uh, yeah, it's it was, kind of similar situation, like the mine close by to Sudwala here, an old coal mine, where some of the community supports that coal mine to go ahead and to, ah, oh, that gold mine. Um, to, to open up again and to extract the gold and to continue mining, whereas uh, some of the other community members are more aware of the environmental risks and the fact that, that, that mining sort of works against other more traditional and much more uh, uh, environmentally sustainable uh, models of development, such as, as diversified agriculture, you know. So it's difficult to do a healthy, organic, diversified agriculture right next to a big operational mine with all the dust, et cetera, et cetera. But obviously some people see mining as, I think through many, many, many decades as a way to, to benefit from the land, you know? But I, I, I believe that if you should quantify all the costs associated with an degraded environment, with uh, people becoming sick, with uh, bad air quality, with bad water quality, if all of those costs are quantified, then of course it, it, it doesn't even make sense to, to mine in the first place, you know? Especially when you think of metals like gold, which we don't really need, you know? And of course, uh, when I spoke <laughs> to Matthew Sklabani earlier, and he, he said that uh, something like 80% of the 
coal produced is being exported, and even our best quality coal is being exported to fulfill overconsumption in other parts of the world. So in a way, it, 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 of course, we need, if we need the energy, we need to mine the coal, but we, can, uh, we need much less um, for ourselves, you know? So that always is a kind of a, of a, of a, of a, of a, of a you know, an issue is this global interconnectedness, whereas we would not mine that much coal, for example, if there wasn't uh, the major demand from countries uh, such as China, uh, you know, just as an example. Um, so, but, but, but uh, you know, I think there is some space for mining, but again, when you quantify all the costs, it just doesn't make sense. Yeah. And also on that is the location of the people, the demographics. If you look at, I don't understand the demographics of settlements, like why like most like locations they'll be near to mines. If mines can be secluded and have their own portion of the far from the community, they can easily be managed and be sustainable. But you find like the location just near to, 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 the, to the industry. So, and people now they are forced to move. You know, they are forced to move just to, to occupy, to make the mind to occupy that space. And to me, I think even the, develop, the, de the Department of Human Resource or whatsoever, Human Sacrament, is not linking much with DIA and other departments to, to see this, this issue of, of locating people. Because in Emalashene, like in every place in the township, underneath those houses, there is coal. Then the question is, how come the demographics, like they, 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 they make things hard for the people? As much as they're located in this place and now these resources is found here and they're being affected now. So there's just a lot, you know, of which I've seen there. And on to me, I've seen with the Malachian is that the only thing that inspired me most about the Malachian is that I saw that place is gonna sink and it's gonna sink definitely. But few people considered that it's sinking because I remember once with Matthew Slava and we were talking about tunnels underneath the city of Malachian that underneath that seat, you can walk from Emalashene till Delmas, just walking underground. So then you can see of these old shafts and of which they're underground and how this acid mine thing comes about. You'll see it was, this thing is gonna bust and the whole place is gonna sink down. At the same time, when we start now to challenge, to say why mines, they don't have a sustainable strategy to say that we want to, develop an alternative industry that's going to be sustainable to you guys instead of like eh, we want to give you maybe like 10 percent we want to help you with this no we want some alternative sustainability from you guys to say that we're having water here how are we going to make sure that our water is clean and we're having animals here how are we going to make sure we're having this so which is preserved but these industries they don't have that sustainability strategy to preserve environment they just have to comply to the laws being given by the government of which it does not work with nature. So in Malacheni, uh, Malacheni, especially now if you can see Igusile and everything like that, you will see that in the future of it, like humans, they will they, they have to move out. Everyone has to pack his back and leave that place because the acid mine range is gonna come and create a huge, a huge dam that's gonna take years to, to that's gonna create hell on earth. That's the future of mining in Malaysia, and I see that. I see acid mine drainage taking over. Because definitely there's no more agricultural land. You cannot, you cannot plant anything there and say, hey man, I'm doing agriculture now. Nah, it won't gonna work. Um, so, in Malaysia, I saw that. Please continue. Yeah, in Malaysia, it's gonna be like a isolate because look at those up the mines. I'm from Force Man, and Force Man, like there are sinkholes just Next to the main road, you will find a sinkhole. Come winter time, this June, you will see them smoking a little. There are sinkholes definitely in the place. So you're living in that environment where there are sinkholes. You know what we're expecting? So like, to me that, and this is all growing, you know, like they, they crack, they grow. Each and every year they increase deep underground. So they come close to the people. So there's not even like a strategy, a mitigating strategy of sinkhole aim and how far this can be stopped. There's no any plan for that. So they are banning. So the huge problem also of those, of those sinkholes is just to those communities. At the same time, 
they cry for service delivery, they march, they protest to get to jobs. At the same time, there's electricity problem, which is an issue in Malachian. Yet coal comes from there to compensate those industries of which they want more energy. Yet there's no electricity much there for the people. So it's just like it's it's funny. At the same time, we, we export, we release too much coal, but we experience a lot of load shedding. And there are a lot of people who are without electricity in the same place where coal is mined. So there's a lot of it is happening. Wow. I've been uh, I've been been saying on these talks in the past that um, kind of not promoting, but uh, I'm interested in 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 thorium nuclear option, you know, because I I look at at, at sustainable options such as or, or green you know energy solutions such as wind or or or, 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 or solar power, um, but I, you know I cannot see it. I I see it as as also being quite dependent on fossil fuel. Um, in terms of the, the the creation of these panels and the uh, the batteries, of course, a huge problem. Um, but I yeah I I I just don't see it um, uh, having the capacity to power our our uh, future future economy. You know, um, not that our future economy must be based on this kind of exploitation that we see now, but. We still we we still be interested in in traveling, you know, and 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 of course we we should. It's always been a kind of a, a, a an idea to 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 have the railways better functional, you know, because that's a good way of moving people and goods is by rail, you know. We to get we need to get these big trucks off the roads, you know, because they create a lot of pollution, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it is a good. Uh, mass transport by rail just makes sense but we're not going to be powering our trains using solar panels you know um not in the in the very near future so i still think that there's a there's space for nuclear and i'm interested in thorium because it's it's it creates much less waste and it is um it's it's much more benign you know it's not that radioactive the waste and it cannot be weaponized so it doesn't produce plutonium as a byproduct, um, from which, of course, they make the, the bombs that they use in war. Um, I want to, to, to move on from Emalachleni, and I want to move to where you are currently based, which is in the Hoogboschlup Valley, not far away from Nelspreet. Um, as you know, the area affected by a little bit of mining, affected primarily by large um, timber plantations which uh, which 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 exist in the area um, of alien timber species of course monocultures um, but I want uh, if you if you can to reflect a little bit on this problem of bush encroachment and even indigenous trees like Taxicanta, it seems as if the grasslands that we know and, and, and love are becoming fewer and fewer and that there's much more sort of, uh, you know, even aliens like Lantana, et cetera, et cetera. Can you reflect a little bit on that, please? Okay, at first in years when I have to meet GSV, when I was still an activist, the young one, um, I'll hear activists from GSV, Zemba, Philip Owe and Del Mancos, they'll be speaking much about timber plantations. And our problem was much mining, so familiar with that much, but come 2020, you know, when you grow up, then you move, you think your problem was worse. Then you move from the high field, then you come to the low field. Then after seeing what I've already saw, I saw Lantana Kamara from the main roads. I saw this plant creeping in, you know, like I'm shocked. It creeps in like the, the sinkholes in, in, in the Malachian, you know, to the communities. It just, it just comes. So those sinkholes, they just come like that. There are also like aliens. So, so I've just seen the same similarities just with Lantana Kamaras and singles to know like they're unstoppable, you know, like they just come and there's no any way where like a focus can be done onto them to say, let's just take this problem of Lantana Kamara first before moving to other invasive alien species. So I'm locating that one with similarities with singles in Emalachin. So being here in the low field, I look at SEPI, with timber plantation, to me, is not there's no difference with Anglo-American. There's no difference with BHP Billiton. There's no, it's just the same guys rolling the same dice. Because 
the impacts of which like these timber plantations are making to the ecosystem, especially to the natural water. Here in the lowfall, there are a lot of horses, natural horses, and now you have timber plantations coming in. You got these trees of which they, they consume a lot of gallons of water. Then you look at the high field. In the high field, you got industries of which they wash coal with gallons of water. So when I'm saying it's just like the same to me. So I feel like that. Because in the lowfield where I'm in, in Hobbes Loop Valley, we got indigenous of which need to be preserved and need to be like conserved at, at, at all cost. So you discover that now you got alien species of which you want to take. And some of them that are being supported in the name of industry because I still re realize, I still categorize um, pine trees and eucalyptus as category as category three, if I'm not mistaken, of, of invasive alien species. So I, I see them as like, they're just like invasive. So <clears throat> here in Hobbes Loop Valley, the, the, the problem really is with the trees mostly. And the best work of which I've seen of which like I'm looking to do here. Yeah. I saw in a manner saying I will never stop a sinkhole. But the best thing here is like you can remove an invasive alien species. Then the, the question is once you remove the lantana kamara, what do you do back to the ecosystem? What, what how do you balance back the ecosystem through bush encroachment? How do you occupy that space again? Because this happens also creates another invasive species to come. If you're gonna remove the species. And now already the place has been disturbed. Then once it is disturbed, look and behold, then you're gonna find a Mexican poppy coming out as invasive also so soon. So I'm interested in solving the next problem to say, you clear this, what's next? How do you balance up? So here in the low fold is like that. I've seen few eucalyptus, some of them, I think they've used them, you know? So the eucalyptus themselves, like they're also in category three, under this invasive island species guide. And yes, they have some benefits in terms of the bees. They love, they love those flowers, but the trees themselves, they, 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 they grow much in numbers. So the work of which I've came to occupy here uh, is just environmental service. So Igu Sasa to me is not it's much similar to Mpuma either against climate change because we advocate the same thing. The thing is that actually now at Igu Sasa, we are practical. We are just taking the problem as it is. And yes, we had some problems in the past because we have seen our government that doesn't want to solve actually the problem. It always just wants the problem to remain there and waste many years just trying to take the same problem. But when we want really action now, we say, let's solve this issue, then uh, you can tell them. Because recently, I've been challenging them with a case study to say in Hobbes Loop, there has to be a case study of invasive island species. There has to be a case study of all those species of fish I found in this place because it's it's one of the places where like you still got nice conservations you still got nice plants of fish like they're rare you cannot find them in any parts of this of this place so i've been advocating them pushing that i'm still waiting for them to hear what they are promising because at igusasa when i look at what we're having the agreement with them there has to be a property an intellectual property maybe a case study or research needs to be done so the basic work of which we want to do as well is to, once we've cleared this problem, there has to be a research work, a case study being done to say in this value, it was like this after, before it was like this, then after now it looks like this. So that's my, that's my work actually now at the moment. So we come with the Department of Environmental Affairs. The first challenge of which we had as Igu Sasa with, with the invasive species, it was like, they didn't want to come to the party and they were, they are lazy, I'll say so. Not about so because I look at the team, there's a part where like we even receive our payment and went to them with a lot of meetings, and we discovered that the only thing that was pending the payment it was only just um, a certificate that that says the work, the previous work was done complete, and the certificate was there, but it, it was not received by the main guy, the art director. So. That certificate was, was given to us and said, guys, why have to delay people because of this? So they said, ah, now the invoice can be, can be paid and this and that. Now things are going better. So like, you guys have to wait a bit. So this was holding you back. So we said, okay, it's fine with that. Then on our last meeting with them, they talked also about the prepayment contract because it was us had a prepayment contract with them to say like, we, they pay us first, then we do the work, then we invoice to them. So now they are changing the whole setup. They're saying, ah, now we're gonna have um, a order number contract. 
to say you guys you work and the hectares of which you've you did you're going to be paid due to that so they've sent to us some some pre-reading contracts to say you guys have to be moved to a pre-order course so read these documents then we're going to come to make you sign them so i'm still waiting for them to do that and to release the payment to the people of which they did the work i think in 20 in 28 if i'm not mistaken mm. so it is with the work with that so the idea of it there's a lot of work needs to be done invasive species are everywhere yeah? so each and every day i was challenging them telling them that you're wasting time because already it's summer and lantana kamara is not waiting with his cousin they grow each and every day so if you are like really want to take the problem, why can't you just realize that there's too much rainfall that just came to, to Hobbes Loop and there's too much uninvasive species if there's too much rainfall. So you guys are delaying already. So yeah, that's most of the work. I can uh, I can just say with regards to uh, Ikusasa that um, I mean, it's uh, because I understand that you do the kind of, of, of work, uh, the working for water work where you would go into areas and, and, and try and reduce the amount of lantana. There's a, a program where, and it, you know, it's important that there needs to be a, a follow up. So obviously it's a program that's designed. And when there's uh, flaws with the funding or when there's delays with the funding, delays with the work, then it, it, it can mean that some of the previous work gets compromised, you know? Because if, if there's no follow up, then it, then the problem can be in a way worse. I just want to mention that there's some areas that I'm aware of where the, the uh, Ikusasa team went through and where the land as a consequence is in a much, much better condition um, than land which have not been, you know, where there's been no intervention. Um, so, of course, it needs to be followed up upon. As you say, there's been a lot of rain. Um, and uh, and 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 uh, that uh, you know there's more ace of invasive alien plants growing and spreading everywhere. There needs to be a program to control it. So it's important that the programs like Ikusasa, they must work. Otherwise, we are all going to be in the shit, you know. Um, and I agree with you that 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 there should be a census on the invasive alien plants because then it might become clearer. Um, uh, you know, the huge problem that we are faced with in the area. Um, are there any other uh, programs that Ikusasa is involved with or potentially involved with, apart from, uh, uh, you know, getting uh, support from the government and through the Working for Water program? Okay, at first, <clears throat> what are we looking at through the Working for Water program is that Hobbes Loop deserves to have a case study. No lie about it. And so uh, I've, I've, I've written a letter to the director to say that there's no way to even to try to terminate two sasa contract because have you came to Sudwala? Have you seen invasive species? Have you seen like that these plants that are creeping in? So actually it means like the work was not even been done from the first from the first place. So in my letterhead, I was I have to stipulate that to tell him that you have to visit Hobbes Loop. You have to come and see before you ever to think otherwise, even if you can feel like there was a year where Igusasa failed to be compliant, but come and visit Hobbes Loop and see the damage of these plants of fish like it actually just coming. So the letterhead, I think it worked because they they, they responded to want to want to take us to a pre-order number to say, okay, guys, you have to go to a pre-order number, meaning that they, they, there are less chances they can cut the work because of that letterhead of which I wrote to them. So apart from that, we're looking at solving the problem as you ask, how do we solve it? We got these invasive species and we got indigenous trees at the same time around this place. So I was looking at populating more of the indigenous trees at first to say that it's gonna be better if we know the problem is in the ground, but if we can populate also indigenous trees, coming with things like indigenous trees necessary, putting some beehives to do the pollination of other trees and just to solve the problem in, in little ways. So the first idea for me of which I came and implemented in this place, it was putting some bees to say, you know what? There has to be like some bees first in this place, you know? So the second prob, uh, the, the second uh, idea of which like I look upon to is dead wood of which like, yeah, I once involved with Owen 
with the training of charcoal making, it is the best idea to turn all these this, this trees of fish, like they need to some of them that they are invasive, some of them like they're indigenous, but like now they are, they are eating the grass for, for animals not to, 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 to eat and to have. So it's charcoal making. Charcoal making is, is, is a better project for fish. I, I think it's gonna work wonders, like clearing and but, um, I using I, the residues. I, 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 I can well, say um, about the charcoal making that it's it's great to be involved in that project. But I you know always when when I think uh, you know about the way that that we make charcoal is, is to think small scale, and with the focus like like the focus that you've brought in also uh, through your discussion now is um, uh, on land restoration. You know, so the charcoal, uh, you know, it's 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 it's. It's not an industry which can provide you with a lot of money if you um, if you don't have a huge kiln and a huge resource of 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 of, of wood. You know, so normally they would make charcoal uh, from uh, wattle trees, for example. You know, where there's a, a lot of raw material available. As you know, with uh, the way that we produce charcoal is on a on a smaller scale where you can use some of the wood, the, um, the invader bush that we find in, into the grasslands. So you can use some of it, but also one, one has to be very uh, circumspect and, and be very selective in the wood that you choose for, uh, for the project and the area. I mean, there's a, with the emphasis on conservation. And I think it's, it would be great to bring that also in to your letters to government, you know, um, because I think that yeah. those might also be things that they support, you know, uh, if one can 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 benefit by land restoration via small things like charcoal making. Again, it's not benefiting a lot because it's not a lot of money that you produce, but you can you can earn a decent decent living. If you if you if you if you make charcoal, you know, and at least you can you can produce your family's energy needs. And what I'm really interested in um, when it comes to charcoal is all the other value adding that one can do, uh, like uh, to produce a, a good quality biochar, or to use charcoal to make those charcoal fridges that we made, you know. Um, because those are things that I think is very, very valuable in a community where there's uh, energy scarcity, you know, um, either due to grid problems or due to financial constraints. Um, charcoal uh, coolers are really uh, valuable. And those are projects that, sh that should be emulated, you know, and I don't see any reason why those should not be mentioned, you know, in your your letters, uh, your ikusasa letters to the government, because um, you know it's it's uh, all avenues uh, should be explored. Um, um, but I'm wondering, are you getting any support from industry like SAPI? I mean, obviously they've got they own a lot of land, and those that's uh, the land that's not under timber, you know, industrial timber plantations on uh, natural land, which, as we all know, are being invaded at. Uh, incredible pace by alien invasive plants like Langtana Kamara. Um, so they also have a responsibility in terms of the trees that 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 sort of escapes from their lands, you know, like you find a pine plantation and into the natural adjoining, you know, natural land adjoining, you find a spread of pine trees, for example. So, uh, you know, now it becomes the adjoining landowners uh, problem because the pine trees are taking root and it's becoming like a pine forest in some areas. But it's not, it's really the responsibility of the industry. I'm wondering, do the, do I, uh, the industry, do they must surely have uh, programs and projects to counter this and to, 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 uh, to, to combat the invasive spread of, of alien plants? Um, uh, did, have they reached out to Ikusasa, or is there a potential project in the in the future? Okay, when it comes to Zapi, at first, if we the, the, the vision of Ikusasa is to is to actually uh, create solutions in solving the problems of invasive island species, 
through added value services to benefit communities and the, um, the ecosystem species are found. So those added value services to us, that's where we are solving the problem because at first the government deals with managing the problem, not actually restoring the ecosystem. So the charcoal, the beekeeping, and even like if we want to do afforestation, planting back indigenous trees, we are looking at an added value service, things of which are going to benefit the communities and at the same time, the ecosystem where these plants are found. So by the look of sticking to the same vision, you find the our new years up in the industry, the main industry of fish like is a planter of trees and uh, they are there, they are categorized also as invasive alien species. You know, I'm all those because when I look at how these trees are categorized as invasive alien species, I look at the eucalyptus and the pine trees, these ones that have been given a license to do it, to plant these trees. But how are they regulating this? How are they being controlled? You know, because they are still invasive alien species. The nature of them, pine trees and eucalyptus, they are still invasive alien species, in spite of like being given a license for you to plant them. Many of they are, they are, they are not potentially in, they are invasive alien species. That's like, they, they, they definitely destroy the land, steal water, similar to Lantana Kamar. But why now the license, how is it being done onto that? So at first we have approached SEPI with a small proposal to do conservation because we wanted to, 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 to build Sasa to, to have more people being employed and us being visible. So we're still waiting for them and I think they receive our papers. And the last we talked with them, like they told us that any financial month is gonna end this month on March. Then they're gonna reply on to us in terms of conservation. But they've told us who's we're gonna do it at a small scale at first end, maybe with few people and they see us if like we're able to anchor a job and everything like that. But our goal into SAP is for us to get an interest to say, once we're inside there, then now we know how to, 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 to play around to see how, how everything has been broken into pieces because you look at Hobbes to build Sudwala, where I'm staying, like, I can just look at that mount of my eyes. You can look, it was once a grassland, patched with grasses, but what's happening now is just bare with like, red soil and you can tell if the rains they're gonna rain. that's gonna be washed to the rivers already there's an impact you can see that impact so what what's the role are we gonna play as ikusasa are we gonna like just do conservation and remove those species of fish that are affecting alien species imagine removing an alien species affecting another alien species and it's, it's somehow it appears if like you are just like continuously like causing the problem so we still have to see our strategy of conservation, if they do give us that work, we're going to work about to say, if we remove this, what are we going to do? Because I'm not interested in removing a, an invasive speech that is affecting a, a pine tree which is an invasive speech. I'm interested in, in replanting afrostation in, in conservation to say we're afrostating. If you remove this, give us a funding or a program to do afrostation, to plant indigenous trees, where this we, we find this this alien species of fish want to us to remove because we cannot remove once we remove like we're opening another problem so i'm looking at afrostation as a problem as a program with them to say once you do afrostation by removing these trees of fish that are harming what you are doing but you're going to put indigenous in our place because that's that's the vision of you sasa yeah yeah i would say that uh, that maybe uh, the term land restoration is a better one instead of to say afforestation it's a better yeah. one yeah um, okay. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I think that uh, that any program or project uh, uh, aimed at uh, removing in, invader uh, plants from natural or semi-natural areas is a good one. You know, so that's a, a start. So even if one uh, cannot have access to the resources or to the capacity, you don't have the capacity to do land restoration per se it's still good to be um, to take an opportunity to be involved in the removal of these uh, of these invasive aliens especially from natural areas and of course then that should involve some kind of follow up action you know and uh, fortunately nature is incredibly resilient and there can be there will be natural restoration if uh, nature is given the opportunity you know um, 
and at the moment we are removing that opportunity by 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 allowing these invasive alien plants to become established but i feel strongly that if one uh, you know remove the invasive alien plants then it again provides that opportunity so i wish uh, you and 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 your colleagues in ikusasa all strength um with uh, with your projects with government with your projects with the industry and i think you must put more effort into uh, you know, even even private landowners, uh, you know, approaching them, telling them what you offer. Uh, you've got a, a, a good team that that you that you've got access to, because it's really important that this kind of of land restoration work take place, and it begins with the stop of that threat of invasive alien plants. You spoke earlier a little bit about, uh, about uh, your involvement with the bee project. I'd like to talk a little bit about that. Um, do you maintain the hives? How many hives do you have? Have you already removed some honey? How much honey did you and what did the honey taste like? <laughs> okay, uh, the bee project is an added value service to benefit the community by the vision of Igusasa. So, we, I think in on last May, 10 May, we at Owens Farm, we have to put 10 hives there to, to, to try to balance everything and to stick to our vision. So in those 10 hives, yeah, we have managed to harvest them. Um, I would say four hives. We had four hives and six frames. So in harvesting that, we, we received, I think it was 87.7 kg kilograms of honey. Just pure organic honey. So my idea of it, yeah, it has to be pure organic. So we, we have to convert it to a liquid honey, but I'm not a fan of liquid honey. I like I like crunch honey where the combs that are there and that, that's that liquid is there a bit. I don't I don't not a fan much of liquid honey. So at the longer run, I'm looking on our next harvest, possibly we'll just gonna not harvest like the way we did it, we won't gonna go to, to extract it and make it liquid. We're just gonna just slice those combs and say because that's 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 how our owner feel the honey. So we've managed to do our first harvest. Yeah, when the hives that as that's still then. But my job now I have to go and clean because what I've seen there, I got some ants of fish that are tempering with them. So I have to go and clean and remove them underneath and check on them. Yeah. So the ultimate goal is actually to is to for pollination and to make it a point that we have this organic honey being available. So that's that's the best thing. I love bees. Bees like oh, bees are the science of beekeeping and so it's like it's wow. Yeah. Tell me, uh, do you do you have a suit and do you use a suit when you're just doing your normal maintenance? When you're just working normally with the bees, do you use a suit um, or do you only use a suit when you are actually opening the hives to remove honey. Okay, when I do my normal maintenance, currently I need to use a suit, but preferably I don't want to use it. But when I'm harvesting, I'm compulsory to use my suit. So what I'm doing my maintenance is just me, a little bit of my gloves, then because the bees must recognize me. You know, they have to know me. I must not come in suit every time. And so I discovered that, that the more they know you, they do visit you. Like you know your bees, so when I'm doing my maintenance, it has to be an eye contact. You see, I have to be there. I have to look at them and and work a bit around them. Then I'm done. Then it's harvesting. And then I'm on my suit. Yeah. And then you and then you you spoke earlier and said that um, that you like the crunch honey. Um, um, but I, I, I'm thinking that the, the reason why you spin out the honey and then you can put the, the, the combs or the, the, you know, the wax back into the, into the, is that not a way of helping the bees? Uh, so otherwise they have to rebuild that structure. And if you can just spin out the honey and you manage to put back those, those uh, honeycombs, they can just... Uh, you know, continue to make honey without first having to make the structure. How do you how do you think about what do you think about that? 
Yeah, I think I think in harvesting them, since the PUX is needed much in the comes and I feel like some of them I can I can make the liquid honey and give the bees some some space, but in the future of it, once I master the technique and everything, I'm going for the crunch honey for that because I feel it's more organic. I feel like even if the honey I've seen is being extracted to liquid, I still feel like in the in the in the eyes of a kuma or someone who likes something organic, it's gonna feel like ah, it's honey, it's ordinary this one. But yeah. even if it's pure in this liquid form, yeah. so I feel yeah. So I mean, I enjoy. I, I wanna see. I wanna see the combs. Then that person must like, like nuts. You know, like nuts. Like, yeah. like nuts. If they're real nuts, and like they're they're crushed. The crushed one. Someone may say, yeah. ah, these are not nice. And those are not. These are not mm-hmm. nuts. Then if they're like the real one is gonna say, ah, I'm feeling a nut. No, I hear, so I, hear exactly I I like the the, 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 the. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, so so uh, I think also with the B project, there's a, a lot of room for, you know, uh, expansion because there's um, many areas here where surely you can get you can sp- uh, put the hives because as you say, it's a benefit to the land uh, to have uh, bees around, you know. Um, but yeah, um, bees, I mean, it's, there's a, a whole range of interventions needed to, 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 to safeguard our planet. Um, I, I'm really interested in the, the, the poetry that you spoke of earlier, uh, when you said that you use drama and poetry. I understand that you're also working on a, on a book of poems. Um, can you tell me a little bit about that and how far is that in uh, that project? And what is the what's the main theme uh, of the poems? Okay, I've done I've done a book already. Just some editing, perfecting them. The title of the book is I Poetry Sai. So it has ten categories, and there are fifty short poems in each category. I said to write it. I think it was the late of the year, early twenty twenty. Now I'm done with it. So you find the first category, I got 50 poems that are based on, on love only. Then the second category, I got 50 poems that are based on time. The third category, I got 50 poems that are based on social social behavior of everything. The, f- the fourth category, I got 50 poems that are based on nature, specifically nature only. Then the fifth category, I got 50 poems based on, on faith and fear. Following category, war and peace. Uh, following category, I got um, religion and spirituality. Another category, I got what? I got I got politics. Category, the, the, towards the last category, I have economics. And the last category, I'm having life and death. So it's just a combination of the whole book. So it's done and I just do my small editing there and there if I'm, not, if I'm bored, yeah. Tell me, so um, how, the, that's how, the work of literature. Is it a long, are those a short, a short, you say it's short, 50 short poems um, that makes up one yeah, category? I've, yeah. yeah, that makes up one category. That's, okay. that's short, of, of, of those short, categories, short, short, but of, yeah. Of those categories that you mentioned, which do you, which one did you enjoy the most uh, writing? So which category did you, did you enjoy writing the, the most? And then which category uh, do you think is most important? Okay, to me, the most I enjoyed it was nature and time. Because in time, it was more like you personify the clock and the clock is speaking. So I enjoy those ones about time. And yeah, in nature and war and fear, I also enjoyed writing about War and peace, I enjoyed writing about that. So the list of which I least enjoyed, it was a little bit challenging. It was religion and spirituality and economics. Yeah, those ones. But I've managed, I've managed to come with them. Politics, it was easy. Yeah. Okay. So um, can, yeah. I, can, can, I, can I ask you maybe to uh, relate a, a, a poem for, for, for us? Yeah, I'm going to recite a poem. Um, is found in the book, it's The Pains of the Elephant, and Elephant River is known in the world. But usually in my art, 
I allow things to speak for if I write, I write in the perspective of what I'm writing about. For example, if I'm writing about the rock, the rock is going to be speaking, you know. So same applies with the with the river. So I get to the feelings of the river by the but what I'm seeing, if it's happy, if it's sad, and if it's like it's being affected by what's happening around it. So Olive and River is a river that that, that originated from then it goes straight to Mozambique, that's where it ends. Yeah. It, it, it passes the low field, it passes through National Park, it passes a lot of places with its tributaries, but it's going that river, it's the best river. I love the river so much. So I wrote a poem like it, The Pains of the Elephant, because the river is so quiet, and then when they drive by, or when they pass its tributaries, they don't think, I mean, this river is feeling something, but it does feel something. So yeah, let me recite it. The Pains of the Elephant. I'm the veins of my body high felt. Bethel is my heart source. I'm the long stretched one. Named after the elephants that commonly drank all my river banks. Oh, Balule in Zulu. Elephants in Africans, eloquently addressed by English settlers as Elephant River, reared as a felantis in Portuguese. My topography. I once transported, uncontaminated, blood on rolling gently sloped the hills to cut through the drunken speck. Nailed with Dolomas aquifers that are drilled with acid mine drainage to highly erodible soils worsened by intensive mining, echoed by cultivation over grazing. To destabilize my banks to be swept by winds of floods that drag my meanders with corporate grid waste along my Kruger National Park stomach, the steered toxins hidden through pipes to hydrologically disturb the integrity of my tributaries, loss of my physical patterns, numerous pens and wetlands, turbidity of my blood meshed by island species of wetlands and pines, power stations, butchering the cords of my spines. Extensively exploited, but my silence ain't golden. Demands of irrigations hate my catchments with the fallacious economy of a few. Egos of Eurocentric minds self-proclaimed conservation to squeeze profits out of the rich while distancing my beautiful view from the poor. I am the vain that tomorrow transport both men, carcass, and vultures who are died of dehydration. Where are my keen aquifers, my perennial tributaries, my favorable wetlands? Few tears I'm asking. A barren widow I'm becoming. Pains of the... It's done. Wow. No, oh, thanks, Bri. So that's... Uh, that's uh... No, it's, I, I, I'm sure that poem has touched uh, many people in the past, and it's nice that it was, you know, that it's something that you that that you do, and I wish it is something that you have an opportunity to do more, you know. So no, I I I want to thank you um, for that. Um, I with I want to ask uh, Robert, um, another participant in the meeting, if you have a question or a comment about any of these things that we spoke of, um, whilst uh, me and Spencer were talking. Um, yeah, no, I had a lot, lot of comments and questions, but I think I'm just going to ask a few today, uh, Spencer. Um, now, so you, you you speak about um, settlements and communities living so close to mines, um, areas that got into the point where you can't sustain a family um, in that locations anymore. And, and to me, that's one of the, the largest or the saddest realities that we, we see in South Africa is this environmental injustice um, where, where those that struggle the most um, often live in the areas that, that that's conducive to struggling. Um, you know, the, I'm sure that that Imad uh, Khleni was. Well, I'm not sure. I know it was once fertile. You know, with the olifants flowing close by and and clean water, and 
you know now you have the the pollution upstream and and i'm and i'm wondering you know who's to blame for for this and who 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 is who should be accountable um for for this environmental injustice that we see today is it is it industry is it government um do you think there's someone that should step up and, and that the pressure should be placed on to step up? Um, and what are the solutions, you know, uh, in, in those areas, especially these areas that, that see this massive environmental injustice? Um, I, think, I think that's the main question I have for you from, from this podcast. I, I want to thank you for your work on invasives. You know, it's something that's close to, close to my heart. So yeah, thanks for the dedication and, and I'm liking everything that I'm hearing on, on what you guys are doing. So yeah, thanks, man. Okay, Robert, to me, ever since I was doing my art, in everything which I've been doing, I don't hesitate who needs to be blamed for this, you know? It's the government, no lie about it, it's poor leadership. That's the truth of the matter, you know? We have a government that is poor leadership and you look at when they are campaigning and you look at the next person who's going to take the power seat and education is a problem you know like like it's not educated that much to take the issues you know different society issues even the location of people so to me i feel like we have a government that's 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 not educated that's the truth you know and that is very old at the same time. But if you go to the municipality of MLS, you're going to see that reality, that these people, like, they're exhausted, you know, they're done, you see. So the solution in the future can be a new government that's energetic, that is uh, people are educated with a lot of issues of which is happening, of which they think globally, and they see the future, how, how things are going to turn up about. So we have people who don't see the long term, Robert, you see. From the township, the location of the township, you have a community councillor. If you sit to that community councillor, then you speak about these issues to him, you'll, you'll be shocked, you'll cry. You know, you'll see who's now we're in danger. This thing will never be solved. So we have a government that gives laws and fails even to implement them and fails even to regulate, and it fails even to do monitoring. And they're scared of the industries. That's the reality. So I, when I was doing my plays, I'll look at that because I'm gonna put the government there, I'm gonna put the industries there. Then when I'm blaming these guys, everyone's gonna see his own problems. So I'll look at the government. When like my character of industry is gonna be on stage, Robert, presenting how the industries they are so posting around, they're so bossy, they don't care because they got the money and the capital and they sponsor the government. And the government people, the officials, they will see that's the truth and they will shrink from their chest. But the thing is that they cannot do anything because they got the industry's got too much power about this government, you know, and they know how to manipulate it. So if you present that thing, the government wants to support you because they are they are failing to control the industries, really. In terms of awareness, and everything, they are failing to control the industries. The industry is more powerful than the government. But at the same time, the government has to, to be blamed because the government is in power. You're blaming it because it is now it can say no to this, but they're not doing so. So the blame it has to be on the government, not lie about it. Right? Things won't gonna change as long as we have this kind of a government. It won't. It won't. <clears throat> can I just say that um, you know, as I mentioned uh, to a little bit earlier, that the problem is a global problem. And then uh, governments globally are involved in environmental destruction through, uh, you know, uh, power policies, uh, energy policies, and 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 also the the you know the the war machine, you know, war industry um, that's that that should that should die down. It's not dying down. It's you know, people are making billions by selling uh, weapons of destruction, you know. So um, I think, yes, definitely, um, there's incompetence on some levels in our government, and there's definitely uh, a lack of, 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 of responsibility when it comes to monitoring and evaluating. And, but, uh, but, but also, I think our government inherited, inherited a lot of the 
like uh, most of the plantations were established by the time that our government came to power, you know. But it's an uh, uh, issue now that our government has to has to face and to deal with. Similar with for the mining industry, you know, some of the mining, some of uh, many of the mines are already closing down, um, and uh, and they're not even producing the gold anymore, and but producing the wealth because they they close. I'm talking of gold mines in the Rand, you know, in Gauteng, where where there's there's much of the gold is already mined, the, the easy to mine gold. So there's still a lot of gold, but it's deep, deep down, and it's very expensive to mine. You know, so the mines are are closing down, but uh, the, the the legacy of mining is still there, and that now has to be dealt with by by our government. You know, so I think that the government also, you know, it's it's more a major task that they have, and we have to keep them to it because it's true they have got a lot of. Uh, a power and, and you know they can make decisions which can affect issues um, and at the moment it seems as if you know more mining and a more export orientated where we should be value adding locally you know so that local people benefit uh, first um, South Africa first or Africa first really I really like this idea of a, and I'd like to know what you think about it this uh, this idea of a, of a of the United States of Africa, and if you think that's a that's a valuable idea, United States of Africa. Yeah, to me, to me, I see there's a brilliant idea. And not for the industries, but some of them, like say, they're gonna go further to a lot of these countries in South Africa and create a lot of problems. You know, like because now they see me, ah, now I can go to Switzerland, I can go to Lesotho, easy. Mm. But it's already to me, them, yeah. <laughs> so the United States of Africa, to me, it can be good in terms of trade. If you can just easily trade amongst each other, like that's gonna be nice. Gonna make the the, the 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 food prices to be cheaper. It's gonna be easy for us to get some cocoa from from Ghana, you know. Because here it's hard to get some cocoa, and you find like you have to buy something at pick and pay, and it's expensive. So uh, look at the point of it's gonna be nice to trade among each other is going to be better. Oh, and we can become a, 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 a stronger, uh, you know, because at the moment it seems as if Africa is just being taken advantage of by other by other uh, stronger countries even, you know, and blocks of like the, like the EU, you know. Um, so if Africa can, it will, because Africa is a strong continent and it's got a lot of, of resources, um, if well managed, you know, at the moment it just seems as if everybody's taking their piece of the pie, but everybody except the people of Africa, you know, you know, in a sense. So um, I, I think from that point of view, um, there might be, you know, less, it, it, we can become a stronger negotiating partner in a way if we are more unified as Africans, you know. Um, yeah, Robert, do you have an idea or thoughts on that or, or follow up uh, question to Spanisa? Um, no, just thanks for that question. Oh, thanks for the answer, Spanisa. And I, I agree with, with both of you to a large extent. You know, I, I feel like there's this, this legacy that was left in South Africa um, that should have ended or, and, or should have seriously started changing in, in 1994. And um, now it should have been to a, to a place where at least a hundred times better than it currently is, but nothing has changed. In, as a matter of fact, it's gotten, it's got worse, um, which comes down to governance. You know, it doesn't matter which, which party we're referring to now. Um, I blame, I blame governments as well. Um, I love the idea of a united Africa. Um, you know, I, I feel that in terms of resources, it's it's so rich and, and, and diversity and culture and Ubuntu, you know, the love of of African people. Um, so I don't know how it will work in terms of governance, but but I like the idea of a united Africa, <laughs> united sub-Saharan Africa. Oh. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Yeah. Um... Yeah. And the issue of like traveling, you. 
and the issue of traveling like, is going to be better because we are tired of this passport thing and we're just tired of it. Want one only one passport to travel all around. Yeah. Um, Spanisa, just uh, your quick thoughts on COVID and getting the COVID uh, or the vaccine. How do you feel about that the whole issue about uh, you know COVID as a as a as a threat and and how has it affected you personally, and uh, do you look forward to getting the vaccination? At first, COVID almost like it destroyed the livelihood next to us. It made us even to migrate. It made it made life to be on hell on earth. But I'm not a person who support vaccines. I'm not a vaccine type of a person because you look at how how government is 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 corrupt, you know. So you have a government of which does not have the capacity even to 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 roll out the vaccines at first. So we have a problem with the government first. So how can they make sure all of us will be safe at first? So that's my first problem. They cannot even do a rollout of vaccines. You know, they can even like make, like speak about the vaccines, like do even good awarenesses about those vaccines. So I mean, I won't gonna be vaccinated even if they can be rolled out. I don't believe in that. I won't gonna get that vaccine, and I'm not even like to to campaign about it, to speak about it to people, because I don't believe. It's, 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 it's business, Owen Phillips, to me. Yeah, it's business. I, don't, I won't gonna get some vaccines, Owen Phillips. But, uh, but I mean, yeah. it, might, it might restrict uh, like traveling options. You know, you might be, you know, not be allowed to travel abroad, for example, if you don't, if you have not been vaccinated, you know? So it, it might have uh, real and serious implications if you're not vaccinated, you know? But yeah, I mean, we'll cross that bridge when we get there. Spaniso, I want to thank you very, very much for your time this afternoon. I'm glad that we have had, that we had this discussion, and I, I'm sure we 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 can have this, uh, you know, uh, discussions like this again in the future. It would be nice. Um, and yeah, good luck with your with your work uh, with, with the land restoration work with Ikusasa with. Uh, uh, with a with a alien invasive clearing work, and uh, especially with your your art and your poetry, which I find uh, inspiring, and and also it, it 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 sort of makes you as a person, it makes you who you are. You know, um, the art and the poetry it, it shapes your soul. So I thank you very much for that, and uh, yeah, I'm going to uh, click on stop recording. Thanks so much, Owen Phillips. Robert, I hope you're gonna come back soon, man. I like to leave him. She was like, Yeah, man, you'll see me, you'll see me soon. That's stress. <laughs> <laughs>